opportunity, Lord, to be in your presence today. God, we thank you, Lord. God, for such an opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we stand here today and we acknowledge our need for you. But God, we want to take it one step further in God and say we want you. God, we don't just need more of you, God. We want more of you today. Such an opportunity, God, to worship in your presence. God, we get to come before you and exalt you. We get to lift our hands and our voices to heaven. Hallelujah. Can we just do that right now before the music gets going? God, we want to entertain your presence that's here in this place. God, you are waiting on us, oh God. And we want you today. God, we need you today, oh God. We acknowledge, oh God. We just don't want to bring lip service, God. We want to worship you from our hearts. We want to worship you, God, from the depths of our souls today. God, we want to lavish praise upon you. God, we want to lavish worship upon you, oh God. The worship and praise that you deserve. God, you deserve it today. So we lift our voices to you right now. God, there is no other place, God, that we'd rather be right now, God. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Come on, is that your prayer today? God, there is no other place, no other place, God, we want to be than in your presence, oh God, in your sanctuary. Come on, everybody needs God, but everybody doesn't want God. But God, we want more of you today. God, we want more of you in this service. More of you in our lives, oh God. Jesus, have your way in this service. Have your way in this service, oh God. Oh, yes. No place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. Here in your love. Here in your love. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be.
here to worship you, Jesus. We're here to magnify you, Lord. God, we give you praise and honor in this place. God, we're here for you and you alone. We're here to magnify you, Jesus. Blessed be your great name.
Hallelujah. Can we just do that right now? Come on, however you see fit, can you lift your voices? Lift your hands in gratitude. God, we thank you that you came and you suffered. God, that you died on a cross. God, you rose from the grave. God, we're thankful that you became sin, who knew no sin, that we could become the righteousness of God. Are you thankful for that today? Are you thankful? Hallelujah.
These aren't just lyrics made up out of thin air. This is the Word of God. He is our Redeemer. said, Lord, there is none other in heaven. I have no one but you. He said, you know what? I don't want anybody but you. Man will let you down as good as their intentions are. They're limited. They're limited. (laughs) As much as we think we're incredible, amazing fathers, mothers, We are limited in our scope of abilities to handle things in this world. But I'm going to tell you what. There's one that holds all of tomorrow in his hands as well as today. And if you'll give him your yesterdays, he'll take care of those too. He's the only one that can do something about yesterday. Isn't that amazing? How many of you got some things about yesterday that you wish could be taken care of? We can't do that, can we? Oh, we can plan and we can attempt to fix things for tomorrow. But so many of us are hung up on yesterday that we can't allow God to have his perfect will for our tomorrow. Today is held captive from yesterday and tomorrow is non-existent. If we hold on to yesterday, we're going to give God our yesterdays. 
I'm here today on a mission. I don't have a really good sermon. But I do have a message for somebody. Perhaps I'm leaving the 99, going looking for the one. I don't know. But I'm here to convince somebody that Jesus does love you. Plus or minus nothing. You can't change the love of God. Uh, You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. No, I don't. But he does. And he still loves you. He's still got a purpose for you. He's still got a future for you. You see, God's the only one that can rebuild a foundation of yesterday and turn our mess into a message and give us, not just us hope, but those that he wants to influence through us hope by our stuff. How many of you got baggage? Ah, we all have a story. We've all been shot by life. We've all been wounded. And truth be known, we probably all wounded someone. Did you know that he was wounded for our transgressions? bruised for our iniquities. That's our offenses. And the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him and by his stripes, I'm I'm quoting the Old Testament, by the way, we are, were healed. That's not just spirit. And that's not just flesh. Because you are body, soul, and spirit. You ever hear of holistic medicine? We serve a holistic God. He went to Calvary for our spirit. Because that's eternal. He went to Calvary to take away this debt, the sin of debt, the debt of sin that would hold our spirit captive for eternity. But he said, you know what? They're going to live here on earth in this temporal climate of earth for a while and I don't want them to live in torment shame and agony of yesterday whether it be emotionally or physically so he said whether they were the offended or the offender I'm going to take care of that so he was wounded for our transgressions how many of you have messed up how many of you have have done things wrong. He was wounded for that wrong that you and I did. He was bruised for our iniquities, for our stubborn ways. He said, I know you're going to be stubborn. I know you're human. He said, so instead of you having to deal with that, I'm going to let you repent of that, give that to me, and I will be bruised for your iniquities. And then the Bible says, the chastisement of our peace. How many of you feel guilty and shame? That was laid upon him. So you don't have to feel guilty of yesterday. You don't have to feel shame for what's happened in the past. Thank God. Nobody but Jesus can do that for you and I. You know the old saying, time heals all wounds. That is a lie. That's a lie. Because the soul is eternal. It doesn't know time. Well, I've gotten over that. Yeah, let me talk to you about it for a little bit. Let me push on that sore for a little bit. And pretty soon you'll say, stop it, that hurts. Jesus said, I don't want you to just deal with that. I don't want you to just heal over that and carry that. I want to take that away. God loves you. In spite of your transgressions, in spite of your iniquities, regardless of how low you may feel in life, God loves you. He's crazy about you. You say, well, why are these things happening to me? 
Well, I'm here to tell you today. Sometimes God allows things to come into our path. Always to correct us or change us. And always because he loves us. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that's here today. Thank you for your word that you've given us today. I ask you confirm this word today. Let your Holy Spirit move in this room and love us, oh God. Demonstrate your love in this place. Let the closeness of your spirit surround us. Visit every heart, whether it's been wounded, or Lord has been the transgressor. And the spirit of shame just covers us, God. I pray that you would love us in spite of it. Blow away, oh God, all the, the chaos of the mind. and Shine the light of your love in the darkness and the recesses of our heart where we have hidden. Oh God, love us today, I pray. Send your love, Lord, through your word and touch our hearts today, I pray. God, the only way we can love you is because you first loved us. Lord, there's somebody or some people here today that are questioning that love let them feel your love today because the only way we can reciprocate that God is to receive it let your love be shed abroad in our heart today let the Holy Ghost minister to every life in this building we ask in Jesus name everyone said amen amen if you have your Bibles uh I've got a lot of scripture today because I couldn't convince you of the love of God. He's going to have to do that. And I pray I don't have to take too long. If I have to take too long, I, well, either I haven't done my job or we're not receiving what the love of God wants to do in this house. Because I can't do with words what God wants to do with his spirit. So I want you to put everything else out of your mind. I want you to put how you're feeling out of your mind. Do you know that your feelings do not change God? Whether good or bad, it doesn't change God. He said, I'm God. I change not. Isn't that amazing? It's a crazy world that we live in where good just a, a little while ago is now bad, and what was bad is now good. This world, how, how many of you, it frustrates you that the world changes so quickly? In the 70s, bell bottoms was in. By the time I got to 80s, we were wearing jeans so tight they choked our ankles off. And now I'm seeing people back in flares and bell bottoms. This world can't figure out what it wants, and I know that's a very crude illustration. But it describes humanity. It describes a world that we live in. And it's, sometimes it's hard to keep up. Isn't it wonderful to have a God that doesn't change? And his word, he said, is forever settled. If it was right, generations, millennium ago, it's still the same today. Isn't it wonderful to be able to put your hope, put your tomorrow? You know, it's not like trying to figure out which way the stock market's going to go. I could put a lot of hope in this because I think by the time this matures, uh, the world will swing 180. No, you can put your hope in this. God loves you. Jeremiah chapter 29. We're going to read from the Old Testament, and then we're going to jump ahead to the New Testament. Thank you, music staff. Thank you so much. Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, is written by what they call the weeping prophet. He's so upset because Israel has messed up so bad for the last year. I We have mixed company and young children in here, so I can't tell you what the Lord calls Israel periodically. He's not happy with them. They have sinned. They've rebelled against God. They, In fact, they have the God that took care of them and led them out of Egypt and sustained them in the wilderness with 
bread from heaven and water that flowed out of a rock that followed them around. The God that healed all their sicknesses, the God that delivered them out of the hand of all their tormentors, the God that went before them and all the battles that they would go in. You read the book of Judges. Joshua and Judges. It'll blow your mind how God won battles and victories for them so, so many times in so many different ways. In one instance, I mean, just a small... I, I don't ever hear anybody preach about this. Maybe I will sometime. He sent hornets in front of them. The hornets drove out the inhabitants. They didn't have to lift a finger. And they traded that kind of a God for a stone or wooden statue that couldn't see, couldn't hear, couldn't move. He couldn't have been put up on a pedestal unless they had put him up there. Had absolutely no power. So God's correction and reproof to Israel was quite stern. It's not because he hated them. It's because he loved them so much. Preached last week, love changes everything. And it does. Right in the middle of all his frustration, God can't help himself. He's telling them what's coming. He's telling them that uh, the, the Babylonians are coming. And he, oh man, he is painting a horrible picture as to what's going to happen. But right in the middle of all this, he stops in Jeremiah 28, 29 and 11. He says, wait a minute. Don't think that I hate you. Don't think that I've forgotten you. Don't think that I've forsaken you. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Now listen, if God thought good thoughts towards a people that had completely blatantly in his face forsaken him, how much does God think towards you? You haven't offered your children up to some idol? hideous, torturous sacrifices that they would demand out of the children. And that God never demanded that, but Israel would slay their own children in such a manner. And God said, I know you're messed up in your head. I know that you've really forsaken me. I know that you've done a lot of wrong, but look, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. I am, I don't hate you. I am thinking thoughts to give you an expected end. Or another translation says an end to hope for. Then you'll call upon me and you'll go and pray unto me and I'll hearken unto you. You'll seek me and find me. And when you search for me with all your heart, I'll be found of you, saith the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all nations and from all the places where I've driven you, saith the Lord. What, God, you caused this to come upon me? Yeah, because if I'd have left you where you were, you would have never returned to me. And you would have been lost forever. I thank God for some of the difficulties that he's caused in my life. They've changed my life for the better. Oh, it didn't feel that way at the time. But I can tell you on this side, thank you, oh God, for your correction. Thank you, God, for your chastening. Thank you for allowing life to drive me back to you. I, uh, the, uh, uh, Psalms 119, the last scripture in that long chapter, 176, says... Like a sheep, I've gone astray. God, you've, you've sought me and you've brought me back. You know, God can't come and grab you and I by the hand and lead us back. But he can cause things in our life to hedge up our ways and bring us back to him so he can love us again. And so he can express that love that he's always had towards us. He said, and I'll bring you back again into the place I've caused you to be carried away, God. I don't want to leave you in the Old Testament, so let's grab a scripture from the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 3 and 19. 
the Apostle Paul's talking to the church in Ephesus, and he said, I've been praying for you. He said, I've been praying that you would know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. I've been praying that you would know, that you would experience. You personally would experience the love of God. I pray today that every individual in this auditorium would experience the love of God that passes knowledge. That, why? So that you might be filled with the fullness of God in order for you to receive the fullness of God, in order for you to be empowered the way God wants you to be empowered. Everything depends upon you believing that God loves you. I'm talking to somebody today. Thank you, God, for your word. I pray, God, that you would impress it upon our hearts. Make it alive to us today. Increase our faith, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for so long. I know I've preached half my way through uh, my, my text. Can I tell you that just because it doesn't make sense doesn't mean that we can't accept the love of God. Just because you and I can't figure it out and just because you and I can't understand it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. In fact, we ought to be grateful that we can't understand the love of God. If we could understand completely the uh, love of God, there would be limits to it. But there is no limits to the love of God. The enemy has just about convinced you today that God has forgotten you and doesn't love you. And based upon circumstances you're going through, you feel that God has abandoned you. Let me tell you something. Life brings brutal circumstances to us all, sometimes unfairly. You did not make it this far by yourself. You are not in this auditorium today by happenstance. You are not here because some individual asked you to come to church or you decided it would be good to come to church today. You're here today because God called you to this assembly. God called you to this room today so that he could tell you, I love you. I'm for you. I've got a tomorrow for you to hope for. It doesn't, tomorrow doesn't have to be like yesterday. You can stop it today. Day. God loves you. The fact that you're still here means that God is for you. Not one of us are perfect. You, you just need to understand that. I don't stand here behind this pulpit today because as a pastor, I'm a perfect individual. I know that better than anyone here. But I also know that God loves me. In spite of who I am. Here's the cool thing about Jesus. The Bible said he came to save his people from their sins. Not in their sins. From their sins. God doesn't love you just because, oh, you're such a lovable person. And just because you're such a great person. God loves you because he chose to love you. There is nothing lovable about humanity. We have this endemic nature that is, has a propensity to sin. It's drawn. In fact, the Bible says that we sin when we're drawn away of our own lust. God said, that's okay. I love you anyway. God said, that's all right. I know that all about you already, but I'm in love with you anyway. Isaiah chapter 55 and 7. Ah, let's just skip all the way to the back. I'll give you what the Lord, I feel like the Lord has put on my heart, and then if we have time, we'll go somewhere else. Can I tell you that mercy, if you've been around, you've heard me preach, teach for any length of time, you know the difference between mercy and grace. But we throw them around, Christianity throws them around like they're, they're synonyms. They can't be farthest from the truth. They are so opposite in purpose. Now, both of them are rooted in the love of God. Mercy is for what I did wrong. Now, this is crazy, Brother Lashley. Often you'll read in the epistles, the Apostle Paul starts with, Grace and mercy be unto you, or grace and peace be unto you. 
You're going to read in 1 Corinthians. He opens up, grace and peace of our Lord Jesus be unto you. Do you know who he was talking to? I mean, later on he gets in their grill. Later on he tells them, there is things going on among you. There's sin in this church that's not likened to the Gentile world. How many of you know you got stuff going on in your life sometimes that ought not be there? How many of you think that God has just forsaken you because it's there? No, uh uh-uh. He starts out that letter. Later on, he tells them, this ought not be in you. You need to get rid of this. You've got to change from this. You've got to let this go. But he starts out, grace and peace be unto you. Let me tell you, I don't care what's in your background. I don't care what your history is. Matter of fact, God doesn't care where you came from. God doesn't care what you've done. God doesn't care what your baggage is. God said, I love you. And I want grace to work in your life. And I want you to have peace about where you've been and what's been going on and how you're feeling about yourself. Oh, thanks be to God. You know that wonderful chapter, and we're going to get to it here in a second, that love chapter? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He's saying that to that crazy bunch that allowed all that mess going on in their life oh and wait till he describes uh, what love is how many of you know what how many of you realize that first corinthians chapter 13 that's the love chapter though i speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity it profiteth me nothing and though i give my body to be burned and, and all this stuff he goes through he said and i don't have love it doesn't profit me How many of you used it, I'll raise my hand first, as a qualifier or whether or not you love people, somebody? I must just be weird. Because, Brother Lashley, I have questioned where I stand. In fact, I've asked God, do I even love myself? Do I... Do I love my wife? Do I love anybody? Because you go down that list, and oh, we can disqualify ourselves quickly if we'll be honest. What is he doing, Brother Lashley? He is defining love. And John told us God is love. So we expect one another not to be jealous. We expect one another not to be judgmental. We expect one another. If you, if you love me, you, if you love me, you love me in spite of. And yet we disqualify ourselves for the love of God when he is the very definition of love. Now this is what God wanted me to give you. The rest of it, I just kind of, it just supported what was going on. You can ask the guys in the crow's nest. There's very few notes about today, but a whole lot of scripture. If I had, I'm reading from the Living Bible. If I had the gift of being able to speak in other tongues without learning them and could speak in every language there is in all of heaven and earth, but didn't love others, I would only be making noise. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing. But God, the Spirit of the Lord, is influencing this pen. And Paul's saying, he said, if I could speak in all the languages of heaven and earth and I didn't love people, I would be nothing. Who's writing this? Paul's writing this. But who is telling Paul what to write? The Holy Ghost is moving upon Paul. The Spirit of God is moving upon Paul. This is God speaking through Paul's pen. And God, we know that the author and the finisher of our faith, the God of heaven, we know he's omniscient. We know that he knows everything. And he said, if I can know all this stuff and I don't love people, what good am I being God? What good am I being Emmanuel? You realize Emmanuel means God with us. 
What good would God be with us if he didn't love us? The scripture says we have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The biggest infirmity we have is being perfect. God said, I'm touched with that. If I had the gift of prophecy and I knew all about what's going to happen in the future and I knew everything about everything, we're talking about God here. Maybe we should say since. Since I know everything, but didn't love you, didn't love humanity, what good would it do? Even if I had the gift of faith so I could speak to the mountain and make it move. I remember when he told his disciples, if you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you could say into this mountain, be removed and cast into yonder sea. And it happened. And God said, if it wasn't based in love, if I didn't have a foundation of love for humanity, what good would it be? What good would I be to you? I'm telling you, God loves you. The greatest thing I told God, I said, the most amazing thing about you is the fact that you are omniscient, you're omnipotent, you are God, you are the ancient of days, and you love me? Are you kidding me? You know all about me? You know all of my wrongs of yesterday, and yet you love me? He said, not only that, but I know all the wrongs of tomorrow, and I still love you. The psalmist said, all my days are in your book. Listen, if he can prophesy, he knows your future. Not just your good, but he knows where you and I are going to mess up. So let's just settle this right now. You can't get good enough to get God. If you could, you wouldn't need him. What you need is God. I said, what you need, you need to put that thought out of your mind. The enemy wants you to feel like if God doesn't love you, if he, if he can't convince you that God doesn't love you, he'll convince you that you never can be good enough. Let's just settle the question. You cannot. I cannot. Yet he loves us. Does it make sense? Love doesn't make sense. The mom running into the burning building to save her child does not make sense. She knows she can't reach the child. She knows it, 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 it's an uh, exercise in futility. She knows it's going to cost her her life. She says it doesn't matter. I got a baby in there, and I'm going after it. Let me tell you what. God so loved the world that he said, I realize I can't do this without dying, but it's okay. You're worth the price. I'm telling you, God ran into a burning, uh, into a burning earth, knowing full well he was coming to die, knowing full well what it would cost him, knowing full well that you and I would turn our back on him at times. And he said, that's okay. I love him, and it's worth it. Right. Right. If I gave everything I have to poor people, and if I were burned alive for preaching the gospel but didn't love others, it'd be no value whatsoever. Here's where I want to get. Love is, everyone say very, exceedingly patient. Psalmist David said, thy gentleness has made me great. Let me tell you, as a pastor, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I could not express how grateful I am for the compassionate mercies, the tenderness, the presence continuing presence of his mercies that surround me each and every day. Love is very patient and kind. God is very patient. Remember God is love. Anybody besides me have ever wondered how in the world he still puts up with me? Not only do I mess up, but I mess up in the same place. Oh, it sounds like I'm in good company or bad company. Do you know that we have tendencies to fail? 
Yours may not be mine. Mine may not be yours, but they're still wrong. And because we fail, do you realize the enemy's been at tricking people for better than 6,000 years? He's got a long history, and he's studied humanity, and he knows how to mess us up and cause us to fail. And we judge ourselves by our own limited understanding of love. He said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. A love that outlasts your mistakes, that outlasts our problems, that outlasts our failed character. An everlasting, that means it outlasts anything. Oh, I'm talking to somebody today. I pray that you're receiving this because your future depends upon you receiving God's love for you. He said, I've loved you with an everlasting love. God is patient. God is kind. Never jealous, envious, never boastful or proud. Do you know God's not so proud that he won't accept you back? That dude has messed up so bad. I remember my father tells a story of his father, which came to know the Lord very late in life. He was just an angry, bitter old Choctaw Indian and could keep a grudge forever. Not kidding. My father tells stories of my father, my, my grandfather, my grandmother getting in an argument, and for over a week or two, sometimes Bishop said for a month, they'd be sitting at the same table, and my grandfather would say, Son, tell your mom to pass me the potatoes. Talk about an old man that could hold a grudge. Later on in life, gave his life to the Lord and God changed him. And the Bible says the love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. And that love began to work in Grandpa's life. One of my aunts, she just went so far off way out in left field literally <laughs> left coast I mean California she severed ties with the family severed ties with God lived a life that the less we talk about the better off we are or the better off more kind we are to her she even changed not just her last name, but her first name because she didn't like the name that grandma and grandpa gave her. She was just so vindictive and so mean. And My father had watched my grandparents be hurt time and time and time again, trying to reach out, trying to fix things, trying to help. And finally, he said, Dad, why don't you just write her off? She's caused you so much pain. She's caused you so much trouble, and she's clearly made it, she's made it very clear. She don't want nothing to do with you or the family. To save yourself pain and injury and hurt, why don't you just write her off? And he said, son, that's easy for you to say. You're just her brother. I'm her father. Uh, and the scripture says, you you fathers, you being evil. He, he compared our love for our children as evil. He said, you think that you would do good for your children? He said, how much more your heavenly father, which is in heaven, would do good things for you? I'm telling you, God loves you. I'm telling you that God loves you, and he's not too proud. It doesn't matter what you've done. He'll accept you back. 
It doesn't matter where you've been. He wants you to come home. I'm telling you, if you've ever read the story of the prodigal son, the, fa- the love of the father smells like a pig pen. Because when the son come home dirty, the son come home in, 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 in distress, uh, the son came home smelling and stinking like the world that he'd been in. The Bible says the father ran to him. He didn't even wait till he got home and said, I'm sorry. He didn't even wait till he got back where he should be. His father said, you're coming to me. I'm coming to you. And he saw him afar off. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, but if you'll turn and start walking towards the father, he will run to you. Because I I promise you he's looking. I promise you he's watching. God loves you. God's looking out for you. Never haughty. Never selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Well, God demands his way. No, God demands what's right for you and I. Love is an irritable or touchy. Watch this. Love does not hold grudges. God isn't mad at you. God isn't doing this because he hates you. God isn't doing this because he wants to get you back. God doesn't hold a grudge. And will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. The only reason God notices our sin is because it separates us from Him. The only reason that God holds a distance from us at all when we sin is because it keeps, it's the difference between His righteousness and our unrighteousness. He said, but there, there is a solution for that. There is hope for that. There's something called the blood that I shed back on Calvary. And if you'll just apply the blood to your life, if you'll just repent, it'll be okay. You don't know what I did. You don't know how powerful the blood of Jesus is. You don't know where I am. No, but God does. And he's been watching you every step that you've taken. And that's why he ordained your steps to come in this building today to tell you, I love you and I'm calling to you. It's never glad about injustice. God does not afflict willingly. But rejoices when truth wins out. Watch this. If you love someone, you'll be loyal to them, no matter what the cost. God's got your back. Really? Then why has all this happened in my life? Because God's got your back. It don't seem like love. Let me tell you, if it wasn't, you and I'd be gone. I'm telling you, God has your back. God is loyal to you. Even when you and I betray him, he's still loyal to us. If you love somebody, you're always going to believe in them, and God believes in you. Doesn't matter who you are, again. God believes in you, sir. God believes in you, ma'am. I promise you, God believes in you. I don't care what people have told you. I don't care what you think your worth is. I don't care what's happened in life and how you feel that life has devalued who you are or maybe circumstances. Maybe your own doing has created issues in your life and you feel so cheap. You feel so worthless. I'm telling you, God believes in you. Your value lies not in what you look like or what you've done. Your value lies in the fact that you were created in the likeness and in the image of Almighty God. And you have a purpose in Him. You have a divine purpose in God. I'm telling you today, you could take your old nature. You could take your old life. And you could put it on the altar. And you can take on to yourself, according to the Apostle Peter, a divine nature. Me? Especially you. The more keen you feel your sense of guilt, 
the greater conviction is working in your life. And let me tell you what, conviction is the love of God. When you and I feel wrong and we know exactly what it's all about, that's the love of God working in our life. It says, hey, you're wrong here. This is going to hurt you. This is going to destroy you. This is going to keep you from a future. But you can get this right. And if you'll get this right, uh, well, why don't God let us just keep doing what we're doing? Because it's destructive. Same reason the doctor tells you, especially if you're a diabetic, quit eating so much sugar, quit eating so many carbs. Well, if you loved me, you'd let me do what I want to do. It tastes good. You must love me a lot, pumpkin. Yeah, but it kill you. God, if you love me, why don't you make it a little easier? Why don't you give me a little breathing room? Because if I do, you'll keep going down that path, and it'll kill you. God is for you. He believes in you, and he always expects the best out of you. You don't even expect it out of yourself. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you do, and God does. You don't even expect yourself to be able to do what God wants you to do. You don't even expect yourself to be able to be right. Perhaps you don't even expect yourself to be able to, to live for God. God knows that you can with him. I said God knows that you can. You can't do it by yourself. But with God, all things are possible. Even the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest, probably the greatest missionary of, of the early church, said, in me, that is in my flesh, there is no good thing. You and I got to realize, without God, we are not good, and God knows that. Before I conclude, let me just go back and grab a psalm. Psalms 103.10 he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter how bad it's been. Let me tell you what. If God rewarded us according to our transgressions and our iniquities, we'd be dead. Because the wages of sin is death. God has not dealt with us after our sins. The Bible says, for as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. Oh, that reminds me, I didn't finish my definition of grace and mercy. Let me do it quickly. Mercy is for what I did. Mercy is for the wrongs that I used to do. Mercy is for the sin that's in my past. Maybe as little as 30 seconds ago, but let me tell you, 30 seconds ago is in the past. And the mercies of God are for to cover the sin of yesterday. But the grace of God that comes with, by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost uh, empowers you and I to do what we naturally couldn't do in our life. So no wonder the Apostle Paul says, grace and peace be unto you. I know what you did. I know your life's a mess. Uh, but if you let the mercies of God cover your past uh, and you'll grab a hold of the grace, uh, if you'll grab a hold of the, the presence of God, the anointing of God, you will don't have to worry about yesterday tomorrow will be brand new so mercy is an illustration of the love of God it's something that has happened the apostle Paul said I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God the cross where blood was shed for our sin Mercy is an illustration or a, uh, something that has happened for our past. You haven't sinned yet tomorrow. You haven't sinned in the next minute. Maybe you wished I'd shut up so you sinned 15 seconds ago. Mercy is an illustration of God's love. It's what has been done for what has been done. Grace, on the other hand, is a demonstration of God's love. 
it's still working. It's working for your tomorrows. It's working for the next minute. Let me tell you, I don't care what happened. God doesn't care what happened in your life a minute ago. If you'll give it to him, the next minute will be different. You may not, I've said this before, I'll probably say it many more times. You may not be able to change your position today. But you can change your direction. And if you'll change your direction today, your position tomorrow will be greatly different. If you're headed south, you're never going to go north as long as you keep going that direction. But if you'll change your direction, if you change your direction right now, it doesn't matter what's before you. If you keep going south, it doesn't matter where you're headed. It doesn't really matter how you've been. If you'll just turn around, pretty soon you'll walk out of where you've been and you'll get into some place new that God has called you to. That's the love of God. It's not just for forgiveness for yesterday, but it's hope for tomorrow. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Why? Because love doesn't make sense. Like a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. That word pity means compassionate love. Like a father has compassionate love towards his children. How many of you have kids? How many of them are perfect? That's okay. If my daughter, if Mackenzie was here, she'd have her hand in the air too. She's at work. You ain't perfect, Mackenzie. She's probably so imperfect, she's not even watching me right now. But you still love them. How many have children that are imperfect? You just kicked them out, didn't you? Seven years old, messed up. I'm going to tell a quick story. I, this came to me the other day, and I, you know one of them cringe moments? I'm cringing right now because I'm going to tell this story. Dad, you remember that old 98 O's dad used to have? Remember, uh, I think it was Tim painted it in metal flake blue. He was, yeah. anybody remember metal flakes? All y'all born in 2000 or later? I'm from the 80s. I remember metal flakes. Big, cool metal flakes that clogged up the spray gun. Dad got his new car painted blue metal flake. It wasn't a new car, it was an older car. We went to Canada. I don't know why. I, to this day, this just makes me, ah. Uh. I can still remember doing it. I remember very little. I must have been maybe five or six years old. But I picked up a rock and scratched my initials. So he he loved that he he talked about that color. All the guys come out. Ooh, bishop, that pastor, that's really neat. That was before he was a bishop. That's oh, that's so cool. Yep, I like it. <laughs> what he should have done was marked me right up that hill and over on the uh, is it on the west side of where the cabins were? There was that eighty foot cliff and just. He corrected me, but he loved me enough that I did other stupid stuff. And at 23 years of age, he was still saying, you know, you and Shelly could live here. So we did for about a year. What I'm saying is God loves you, 
It doesn't matter how much you've messed it up. He pities you. He has compassionate mercy upon you because he's your heavenly father. And he's not going to kick you out just because you messed up. He's not going to kick you out of his plan. He's not going to kick you out of his purpose. He's not going to kick you out of his will. He's not going to kick you out of the family because you messed up. You were made in his likeness and his image. He breathed in you the breath of life. His spirit resides on the inside of you. God is not going to kick you out. God loves you. He know why? Because he knows our frame. He knows your frame. He knows what you were made out of. You weren't made out of platinum. You weren't made out of gold. You wasn't made out of silver. You wasn't even made out of nickel or copper. You was made out of dirt. And you don't expect much out of dirt. But because you made it with your own hands, you love it. And because you breathed your life into it, it's part of you and you can't let it go. So the final definition of love, if you love somebody, you always stand your ground in defending them. Let me tell you what, God's got your back. The enemy comes in and he's the accuser of the brethren and he starts bringing up your wrongs and your past and God says, yeah, I I know. I know. They're dirt. created them of the dust of the ground and the next time the enemy comes along and starts accusing you to yourself you tell him yeah I'm made of the dust of the ground I'm made of dirt I'm human and I have you to tempt me You couldn't even do what was right before there was a devil. And you're made of the celestial bodies. And you can't do what's right. And you're going to accuse me. God knows your frame. Remember, he created you. That's why he loves you. Would you stand with me? I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't know why he cared. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. Oh, but I'm glad. I pray through the word of God in my faltering attempts today, I have convinced somebody that God loves you plus or minus nothing. You can't do anything to make God love you anymore. And therefore, you can't do anything to make him love you any less. His love is everlasting, and it doesn't make sense. Aren't you glad? Every head bowed, every eye closed in this building. They drug her to Jesus. out of the bed of adultery with certain death hanging over her head because in that day to be caught in the act of adultery was a death sentence they drug her to Jesus in all of her shame I'm sure they didn't wait for her to put clothes on and they drug her before the righteous God. They they drug her before the just one, the perfect one, holy. In the temple. And they cast her at his feet. They began to levy the charges against her that day. 
in her shame and in her guilt. She lay before the Lord. Moses says that she should die. What do you say? The law says that she's wrong and she's got to pay the consequences for her sin. What do you say? Oh, we all know that we've messed up and the accuser of the brethren shouts in our head, you've messed up. You're disqualified. You're not valuable to the kingdom. Somehow he gets in our head, negates every scripture that I have quoted to you today. As she lays before the Lord, her fate hangs in the balance. Uh, If you're going to accuse me, accuse me to Jesus. If you're going to bring accusation against me, accuse me before the one that loves me and gave himself for me. Because love never fails. Love never gives up. Love never backs down. Jesus said, let you without sin cast the first stone. The story goes it one by one as he began to write in the sand. Nobody knows what he wrote that day on the on the stones of the temple. But one by one they begin to leave. And we come to the most important part of this story. The Lord looks at her and says, Where are thine accusers? And in the presence of God, every accusation had to flee. Not one accusation, as true as they may have been, could not stand in the presence of Almighty God. Every accusation had to leave. I'm telling you, if you just get in the presence of God, every every feeling that you have, every word that's been spoken into your mind, every negative thing that's been spoken to you about who you are and about God's attitude towards you would leave. If you could just get into the presence of God. It doesn't matter how you get there. It was the best day of her life to be a drug out of her sin and cast before the Lord Jesus. I don't know why you're here. I don't know how you got here. But I'm telling you, this is the best day of your life. You're in the presence of the one that loves you more than anybody in the world. And everything that you've ever done, all the greatest sins that you have ever committed will simply vanish in his presence. Where are your accusers? tell you if you can get in the presence of Jesus and just give it to him he'll take care of every one of your issues he'll take care of every one of the accusations against you because God loves you she said Lord no man I believe at that moment she had a revelation of who stood before her she said no man Lord What she was saying is, everything that's human that could judge me has left. You are the only one that has a right to pick up a rock. You are the only one. No man, Lord. And watch this. Neither do I condemn you. I'm telling you, God is the only one that can hold you guilty, and he refuses to do so. Lord, deal with the heart, I pray, right now. Call those, God, that have been hurting, those that the enemy has lamb blasted with this propaganda against your love let them feel the love of the father right now come on if I'm talking to you today and 
you would like just to come and revisit a place of commitment. Maybe you've never, you don't know what you're feeling right now. Maybe you've never given yourself to Almighty God and laid your sins at His feet and asked His blood to cover you. I'm telling you, there's a place of complete newness of life. The greatest opportunity of your life is before you right now. And if you would like God, come on. The enemy's told you that God doesn't love you. The enemy's told you that God is against you. The enemy's told you there's no hope. And you've almost bought that lie. But you're here today because God has brought you here to tell you, I'm still crazy about you. I'm still reaching for you. You're still valuable to me. Come on, if that's you, I I invite you to come and respond to that love today. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Let me tell you, God's only going to love you. If you're concerned with COVID, I completely understand. But if you're not, and you would just like to recommit yourself and renew yourself in the love of God today you would like God to touch you, I I encourage you to come to an altar. I encourage you to come to a place where God can love you and wipe away all your memories of yesterdays, your hurts and your frustrations and your pain, your concerns that God's not for you and let him love you.